Now that we're in the Romantic period, we are in what is perhaps the golden age of opera. You still will see a lot of Mozart operas performed today, but if most of the opera repertoire comes from the 19th century. Great stories, great music, what's not to love? As we looked at Mozart and the Marriage of Figaro, we saw that the characters in that particular story were servants and their own, their masters, and we saw a lot of um, satire about that. If we had watched some other operas in that period of time, we would have still encountered many of the same kinds of characters and just in different kinds of situations. Once we get to the Romantic period, remember that this is the period of time where we are interested in everyday sorts of people. So we see operas that have a much broader range of character types. We still have some um, historical kinds of, where we take historical characters or mytho mythological characters, but for the most part, the, the operas that we see a lot today have real people kinds of characters. Think about some of the really famous operas that are performed a lot. Carmen, Carmen the cigarette seller who flirts with soldiers and flirts with bullfighters. Now, most of us don't know any bullfighters, but if you lived in Spain during that period of time, those would have been the kinds of people that you would know. Um, but on the other hand, we have some very exotic kinds of characters, which comes from that whole idea of exoticism that we already talked about. So we, take, we look at operas like Madame Butterfly, which is set in Japan, or um, Aida, which is set in Egypt, which doesn't seem like that exotic a locale, but at that time, that was sort of like, that was, that was kind of a cool place to go. So we see a lot of different kinds of characters, a lot of different settings, so we're no longer stuck in Europe. We have operas that are set all over the place. It leaves us with some really interesting things musically, and uh, I don't even know what word I want to use for this, but basically what you end up with is things like this. So we have Carmen, who is a Spanish character, and the entire opera is sung in French, because the composer was French. Madame Butterfly, everybody's singing Italian because the composer was Italian. So you get some sort of strange things like that, where they're not singing a language that has anything to do with the country that they're in, but you still know that we're set in this particular country, in this particular time period, and you get a real sense of time and place. That's not always true with some of those earlier operas. Uh, you know, the, the Marriage of Figaro could have been anywhere over like a 250 year span because it's just got some royal people in a big house. That doesn't give us much definition. So we're getting much more clearly defined about where things are happening. So up to this point, we've been having operas where you'd have recitative, recitative, aria, aria, recitative, throw in a chorus, and you know, off we go. Things were sort of compartmentalized. You could, you could see where one thing started and one thing stopped. Once we get into the Romantic period, composers are more interested in making it a seamless kind of production. So we no longer see, this is a recitative, I'm telling you the story, this is the way it goes. Now I'm going to sing beautifully for you. That doesn't happen. Everything flows. So even the dialogue sorts of parts are much more interesting melodically. They are accompanied by much more of the orchestra than we would have in the classical period. And when we get to the arias, they are more closely like conversations. So we're not having a lot of that artificial, let's go back and say the same thing we already said, just to, because we can. Once they've said what they're going to say, they move on. So that's one reason the operas are shorter when we get to the Romantic period. They're not repeating themselves a lot, and they're not um, making these grand dramatic pauses just so we can do a nice aria. So we're going to look at a bit of, of an opera, and I'm leaving you the entire opera to watch. This opera is by Giacomo Puccini, who is an Italian composer from right around the end of the 19th century. The opera is La Boheme. It's very, very famous. It didn't start out that way. When this opera first came out, it really wasn't very well received. They thought that, you know, it was just a little too emotional and too dramatic for the time. But it has definitely stood the test of time because now it is one of the most popular operas in the world. So La Boheme is another one of those where we have sort of a conflict of information here. It's set in Paris. But Puccini's Italian, so they're all going to sing beautifully in Italian, all these lovely French characters that we have um, in the story. It has a very small cast in terms of the, the important characters. So we have four men who share an apartment. And remember we talked about the Romantic period. This is the time when if you were an artist that you should be starving 
These guys are the starving artists. So we've got a musician, we have a writer, we have a philosopher, there's a job description that's guaranteed to bring in the big bucks, and we have a visual artist. So we've got four different kinds of artists living in this really squalid kind of apartment. So they're the, they're the core group, our four guys. And then we have two major female characters. One is Mimi, who is a woman whose job description is that she embroiders flowers. So she, she makes flowers. And the other woman, who, Musette, who I can only describe as a professional flirt. Uh, she finds men who will take care of her. So she's, she's always in the, usually looking pretty good because she's got somebody who's taking care of her. And that was not an uncommon thing for women at that period of time to find a wealthy man who would take care of them. You know, set them up with a house, pay for their clothes, provide them with carriages. That's Musette. So Musette is, is sort of a, um, an outsized character because she's just this big, and, you know, here I am, love me or, or not, T take it or leave it. And Mimi, who is a very sort of quiet woman. So the whole story revolves around these two women and these four men and their interrelationships. Now, there are some great big scenes in this opera as well. Opera goers like their big scenes. There, the biggest scene is in the second act where the six of them have gone um, into Paris. I mean, they're in Paris. They've gone out to eat. It's Christmas Eve, so there's lots of people in the streets. There's a parade. And if you do a, they do a really big production, and the one that you're going to watch is from the Metropolitan Opera, so it is really big. They actually have a horse and carriage trot across the stage and um, lots of children running around. So it, it creates this massive crowd scene. There's even a marching band that comes through for the parade. So you won't see that kind of lavish production everywhere, but that's, that's what the composer sort of had in mind. So we have this very intimate group of six, and then we have this one great big scene where we have a, a ton of people on the stage. Um, as you watch the video of it, um, I will say for one thing, you can skip through all the curtain calls. It's the Metropolitan, and so there's a curtain call after every act and everybody comes out. So you can speed through that if you want to hasten your path through this particular opera. But it's, um, the orchestra is wonderful. And as you listen, you will see that they're playing almost all the time. And, and there, that there's no big overture either. So remember all the, the other operas in the past, we had a big overture at the beginning that got everybody settled down. Well, this overture, the whole overture is something like, da dum 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 that's it. The curtain comes up and the action starts. So we cut out a lot of that. It's, I won't say it's extraneous because a lot of those overtures are absolutely beautiful. But... Puccini guys didn't feel that we really needed to set up this story. The story was going to be very clear just from the what's on the stage and the music that you get. So you're not getting a whole lot of orchestra by itself. We're going to watch just a very small segment of this. This is in the third act. So Mimi is the, the woman who will be doing most of the singing. She is the embroiderer of flowers. And she, we know at this point that she's dying. So she has come to this um, place on the outskirts of Paris, where she knows that Rudolfo, who is her love interest, that he's working there. He's, he's the um, writer, so he's gone to this place to work. And she's come to see him. They have a, um, a very on-again, off-again relationship. You know, they're, they're either very happy together or they're fighting. So it's, it's a sort of your basic soap opera sort of story. But as you listen to this, look at how the dialogue happens here. We're no longer just sort of saying the words in a not particularly interesting melodic way. Even when they're just talking to each other, the dialogue is sung beautifully and the orchestra is contributing to that. It's not just something to sort of hold them up while they're, while they're singing that. So let's look at this particular segment of the opera. Thank <laughs> you. 
insegna il fatto ai passeggeri e ho vinto quei guerrieri sulla facciata e freddo e frate a good sense even from that little segment they're basically having a conversation she comes in she asks this woman if Marcello is there Marcello is the gentleman that you see he is Rodolfo's roommate and it, it she's singing beautifully but you know it's not an aria there's they're just talking and and when Marcello comes out they continue their conversation but the thing that really makes it romantic is the sudden changes of things you know it's like everything's like this and ah! all of a sudden it's like that so the the very dramatic changes that we talked about in terms of romantic style sudden changes of dynamics sudden changes of style you can see all that in just like three minutes here in this opera and now you know we've got two hours of that if you get the entire op watch the entire opera so it's no longer clearly defined that we are now this is recitative this is aria everything flows together the storyline just continues seamlessly and we get a good sense of that. As we look at um, opera uh, at a little more detail in just a uh, minute, we'll look at composers like Verdi and Wagner who went beyond this. They probably would have not liked this piece at all. They did some, some very different kinds of things. And we will look at how Wagner in particular takes the opera and does something really new and interesting with it. So I hope you enjoy La Boheme. Watch the whole thing. Again, you can skip through all the curtain calls and uh, enjoy the beauty of the Metropolitan Opera's production. They, obviously, they put lots of money into it. People applaud when the scenery comes up because the scenery is so amazing. So enjoy it, and we'll be back to talk about more opera in a minute.